Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the web's talk show about the Gnostics, Gnosticism, mysticism, and anything else that's even tangentially connected that we feel like talking about. I'm your host, Deacon Jonathan Stord. I'm joined by my co-host, Jason Memo. Hello, Jason. Hello there. And we've got an uh, uh, awesome topic, awesome guest uh, for today's show. It's uh, Monsignor Jordan Stratford, who's here to talk to us about St. Cyprian. Hello, Monsignor Stratford. I'd say good morning, but actually, I don't know what time ever it is, wherever you are, have a good thing. Yeah. Hello. I, what, <laughs> you know, we, we've known since, since Einstein and the the mystics before him have known that, that time is not an absolute it is completely mutable. So when is it? Who knows? What does it matter? It's all time simultaneously happening right now through the flow of the divine. Uh, before we get into this uh, great topic with Monsignor Stratford, with uh, St. Cyprian and everything around St. Cyprian, uh, we first have to do a little bit of uh, homework. We have to uh, take our, our, our vitamins before we get the, the spoonful of sugar. We got to eat the liver before the dessert. And that is uh, our commercial. So I, I hate doing it because I hate all things uh, connected to money. So to, to make it better, we're, we're trying to do it as fast as possible. So last last time we did it, it was 38 seconds. Jason, you're ready? You tell me, ready to tell, go. Okay, tell me when to go. And one, two, three, go. We're brought to you by viewers and listeners like you. We can't do the show without your financial support, so please go to paypal.com slash... Uh, uh, pay, no, uh, paypal.com slash Gnostic for one-time donations. And if you want to become a patron of the show, you can do it by going to patreon.com slash Gnostic, where you can donate for as little as $1 per piece of media per month. If you do that, you get early access, a week early access to all of our shows, and uh, no other perks, but you get to help us continue the show. We'll think of some more perks for the future. And, uh, and also, if you can't help us out uh, financially, you can like uh, the show, uh, share, subscribe, send it to your friends, Friends, tell your friends about it, share it on your social media, leave us a good review on Apple Podcasts, subscribe to the YouTube, take your favorite episode and send it to your best friend in the whole world. Done. Uh, well, yeah. That if you are pregnant, they're likely to become pregnant. Symptoms may include. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, Ask your doctor if Doc knows this is right for you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I think I, I cut you off there, Jordan. What did you say? Oh, no, I was uh, uh, rambling. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so, uh, John, you're at 49 seconds on that one, but you did have, I give you like a 10-second mulligan for the uh, for the stumble. Yes, 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 that's true. So, whoo, ye, okay. Actually, actually done worse. Well, there's always next week, so fingers, fingers crossed on that. Um, okay, well, let's rock and roll. Uh, my senior Stratford, a... An obvious question to begin with, and I know that this is a very deep, long, complicated question, so if we could get the 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 elevator response. But uh, who was uh, St. Cyprian? Okay, the bad news is you're trapped in the elevator, and it's not <laughs> moving. Uh, because it does take longer uh, to, to drive, uh, to, to respond to that question. I guess the, really the quick one is not who is St. Cyprian, but what is St. Cyprian? We're not talking about an individual, we're talking about a phenomenon. And that's probably the easiest way to, to understand this. And that phenomenon has uh, manifested in different periods of time, in different locales, for different, although similar, reasons. And a lot of those reasons uh, deal with politics and power and domesticity. Uh, so, uh, let's talk about where, where I am rooting my own experience in, in space and time. I'm here in Victoria, British Columbia, in Canada. Uh, that was ground zero of the satanic panic in the 1980s. And it was a lot of the, the themes that were the recycled anti-Semitic protocols of the elders of Zion tropes about a baby eating or blood drinking cabal, actually running things. And it was supposed to be here. Um, and it was attributed to... to at one point, obviously, initially to to Jews, um, then to uh, Satanists, and then we see the same things with the QAnon phenomenon. So uh, that kind of conspiracy thing is uh, is really versatile and plays different roles. 
which is not to say that since Cyprian is a uh, is a conspiracy theory, but here's how it fits in. During the Satanic Panic, there was absolutely a uh, of an evangelical phenomenon, wherein uh, mostly kids, adolescents, would go to Bible camp and at first, and you know maybe their their biggest transgression in life, the thing that they felt bad about, is that they snuck a cigarette from their aunt's purse or they divvied a beer at a, at a, at a family wedding. Um, and that these stories, when you're having to kind of confess your, your sins or say that the things that you had done, um, didn't get a lot of traction. And to really get cred for your conversion story, you had to you know, say, well, you know, I, I didn't just um, sneak a cigarette from my aunt's purse. Um, I was a heroin addict or, you know, I had to, um, you know, I didn't shoplift. I robbed a liquor store at gunpoint. So these stories became like, really inflated in order to make the conversion more significant and more valid. When we look at the initial legend of Cyprian, that's what's happening. There's a political mechanic at work here. And that's kind of what I want to bring back to. So we, um, when we're looking at unpacking the whole St. Cyprian thing, first step is to not confuse St. Cyprian of Antioch, the subject of today, with St. Cyprian of Carthage. Different individual lived 50 years earlier, different part of the world. The second step is to immediately confuse and conflate those two individuals, um, <laughs> borrowing liberally from the lives of both uh, in order to unpack the rest of this story. So obviously um, what that uh, note does is say that we are not dealing here within the realm of biography, but of phenomena. So the so we have the legend, and the legend is um, golden legend, which was a uh, a series of stories. Uh, these were mythologies that were very similar to the circulation of the, the Arthurian legends, but these were about the the saints, and these were uh, you know quite quite gory, quite cinematic, uh, and they were fireside tales that were morality tales, but they really dealt with sacrifice, uh, martyrdom, um, the integrity of standing up to authority when that authority is sin and evil and, and the bad guys. And there's the, you know, the hero of the story is always noble, so noble that they end up becoming, you know, disemboweled or something that you can really, you know, um, uh, sell to an audience. Um, we don't know if there if there's any historicity to to any of these, except that a lot of them deal with um, things like uh, Roman execution processes, and um, then uh, and certainly contemporaneous forms of, of torture. So it was um, it was plausible that some Christians at some point had uh, been subject to similar uh, horrific. Uh, forms of martyrdom, but we don't know if Saint X actually went through this. But here's the story. Once upon a time, we have a uh, a young scholar born in Turkey, uh, in, in Antioch, and his parents are pagans. He's, this is sometime in um, the early third century, so 220s, 230s. He um, uh, is he has a lot of promise and he is sent to Greece to study and he becomes an initiate of the uh, the, the Pantheon. He becomes a, a, a initiate of the Hellenic Pantheon. Um, not just one god, but all of the gods and all of the mysteries and all the mystery schools and everything he has to offer. And um, he excels. He's this extraordinarily gifted uh, pagan priest. And he wants to know more, and he ends up going to Sparta, and he learns about necromancy, he learns about bringing people back from the dead, and he becomes the smartest guy that they've ever seen, and he goes through the initiations, and he uh, gets you know, a collection of, of what in modern occultism would be, you know, a collection of very impressive hats and, and, uh, and sashes and secret handshakes. He goes to Egypt, he becomes an initiate of the, the Temple of Isis, he, be, he goes to um, Iraq, he becomes the, the greatest astrologer. Basically, he does this tour of, of the Middle East and he collects all of the keys to all of these mystery schools so that he is the most well-rounded and most experienced person. So he actually represents the, the culmination of all of this knowledge 
that the uh, antique world had, the classical world had to offer for anyone interested in magic. And he gets home. So he's back at Antioch, super smart, Doctor Strange guy, uh, very uh, very high renown, and um, uh, most of the the uh, recourse to magic uh, in that period were as they are today. They are around domestic issues. They are financial stresses, um, uh, reconciliation with a, a loved one, trying to make someone fall in love with you, trying to avoid some, avoid someone who is, uh, is, is upset with you. Um, and so these are very human scale concerns. Within the legend, um, a, an unnamed individual comes to Saint Cyprian and says, there's a girl. There's a woman. I'm completely in love with her. I need her to fall in love with me. I've you know, done the usual thing. Uh, she's ignoring me. She's taken a vow of chastity. She um, is, uh, is only into her religion. I don't know much about it, but um, she is immune to my charms. And I need you to get, get your demons on, whatever you need to do. Here's some money. Cast a spell. Make this girl fall in love with me. So St. Cyprian cracks open the spell book. He does a simple love spell. He follows up and nothing has happened. So he digs a little deeper. He counts, he summons some demons, sends the demons to uh, t torment her until she falls in love with him. Nothing happens. He's not getting any traction with this one individual. He doesn't know why. Eventually he discovers in the legend that this woman named uh, Justina uh, is, uh, is Christian. And she is, every time that she senses this magical attack or magical persuasion or the presence of demons. She casts this, she, uh, she says a prayer and she uh, does the sign of the cross. And sometimes she has a physical cross, sometimes she makes the sign of the cross, but that's enough. And she is basically sealed off from the screen entirely. But learning about this, learning that, that she has uh, access to magic that completely defeats everything that he's learned from the entire Mediterranean and here's the rest, really important part, is that he comes to her, he says, okay, how did you do this? She tells him about Christianity. He instantly becomes a convert, and of course, being very clever, he then becomes an initiate of that mystery school, climbing through the ranks of deacon and priest, and, and then eventually bishop. Um, there's definitely some pushback on the whole bishop thing, because that's where people say, no, he wasn't the bishop. That's Antioch of Carthage, who was the bishop. But we still have this within the legend that he has gone through this initiatic process and come with a full understanding of Christianity. And that is the thing in a nutshell. And is that why he's associated with, um, with the esoteric and uh, the occult and um, uh, used by esoteric uh, uh, practitioners because of this, um, the fact that he, you know, uh, uh, joined all these different organizations and got all this different knowledge and united all of this wisdom within himself? It allowed, I mean, it, it allowed a number of things, which is why I say there's a phenomenon that pops up in, uh, in different cultures for different reasons. But we're getting into the idea of authority and theurgy. So theurgy is literally being divine work, okay, or a wonder working, miraculous work that is divinely inspired, comes from God rather than sorcery or goetea. Uh, goetea is the contemporaneous Greek term um, it comes from, which means the wailing or the howling. It comes from classical Greek uh, uh, and pre-classical funerary practices whereby you have a chorus of people who are wailing in grief. It is they're giving voice to loss. And that sound of loss and, and torment, those of you who, who have grieved know that, that wellspring of grief. That that is um, considered to be a, a, a holy space that is a, a doorway between our experiential world and the afterlife, traditionally depicted in models of the time um, as the underworld. So it is this wailing, this outpouring of grief, these, these uh, uh, irrational, supra-rational sounds 
um, that uh, invoke and open the gateway to the underworld. So the difference between wonder working and sorcery is really just a question of who authorized this? Who let you do this? You're, you know, oh no, this is a spell and this is prayer. And what is the difference? The difference is you're allowed to do a prayer and you're not allowed to do a spell because there's an authority who says so. So this all idea of authority and magic is, is interesting. We see it two, in two places uh, within, we see it within the Hebrew Bible. Uh, Moses shows up and he does the, the, the serpent staff trick. Um, obviously he's parting the Red Sea. He's doing a lot of heavy lifting as far as magic is concerned, but he has the authority to do so. So it's not the, the it's not the thaumaturgy that gives him the authority. It's the authority that gives him the thaumaturgy. He's on God's side, therefore he's allowed to do this. We see the same thing in uh, the New Testament mm -hmm. where Jesus performs these miracles. He does this thaumaturgy and he has the authority to do this. He can change reality because he's got the permission slip, being God actually helps. Um, and you know, therefore these miracles occur. They are considered to be thaumaturgy, not goatea. They're not sorcery because of, of this authority. So when we have um, the invocation or even the reference to uh, St. Cyprian, we're really talking about the permission slip of here is an actual saint. So for Cyprian, his story doesn't end well. After his conversion, um, he is persecuted under Roman Diocletian, and uh, uh, Diocletian has beheaded, has uh, Justinian beheaded, has an onlooker who's so inspired by their uh, their con their conviction to their faith that he gets beheaded. Everybody's beheaded. And uh, and he's eventually uh, uh, dropped off at um, the Basilica of Constantine. So um, that's uh, that's all part of the of the Golden Legend. But it is the the purpose of making this distinction between thaumaturgy and Gotea um, that it's okay for Saint Cyprian to do it because he has this authority. He's a saint, um, and so it puts you on the right side of that argument. Um, and it also is a propaganda tool that says Christians have the best magic. So even if you are coming from uh, these very well established traditions, whether they are in, in Persia or they're in Iraq or they are in North Africa uh, or they're Greece or, or Rome, um, that here's a guy who was the best at all of these and he chose the best magic that he could find, which was within the, the sacramental practice of the, of the Christian church. And in fact, one of the spells that he's most commonly associated with is the use of a, of a steel key to seal, to lock up um, a, a patient, or the subject of the spell, against all magical influence. So he has, he lays on, and here's the spell book. You take the you take the key, you bless it. it has to be a steel key. You bless it. Uh, the uh, you place it against the breast of the individual, and they are then sealed from any magical influence or any magical harm. Um, that again is that propaganda that propaganda that says Christianity has the good stuff. If you're really looking, if you're interested in magic, this is where you want to be. Um, and it, it just proves or establishes the superiority of that practice. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll let you sort of uh, jump in if there's anything you want to, need me to clarify before I go on to the next bit. Sure, Jason, do you have anything? Uh, well, like, I think there's a couple of things there that I thought I really appreciated, that idea of the, the difference between a spell and a prayer being uh, you know, whose side you're on kind of thing. Um, and I, what I'm also wondering too is if there's a, le a level of like uh, post facto definition, like uh, we're going to call these spells and we're going to call these prayers uh, as as we develop the myth, you know? Um, so how much like uh, public relations work was happening 
among the Cyprian fans from then to now. Um, but then also, like I know uh, Jonathan's got a question here about, uh, especially I think why occultists, why he's been popular with occultists, and also I think why there's been popularity recently. And this is sort of me uh, making a theory and then asking you to comment on it. Uh, is is there um, is this this like his transition from occultist or like pagan mystic to saint? Um, like kind of a good bridging experience for a lot of occultists who are, you know, trying to square their own appreciation for the church with a, uh, like a, a maybe more pagan or occult background in their past? I think rather than answer that on an individual level, because we do live in an, an era of individuation that is mm -hmm. now an individual call, um, before in the, in the pre-modern era or the dawn of the modern era, this was not an individual call, but rather it was a social call or a cultural call. It was a collective call. So when you have, you know, we go from the golden legend um, in the high middle ages, and when the time we get to the Renaissance and the, and the early modern period, we have the, the, the kickoff of the grimoire traditions. Um, and, you know, these are, are collections, um, certainly, you know, the, the idea of, of bundling all of the stuff that you could get on a subject. There's an idea of a magical compendium. Uh, this has a, a very long pedigree, obviously the, the, the most robust and the best well-known to most audiences, the Greek magical papyri. Um, and it's a wonderful storehouse of unrelated stuff. There's just, and, you know, and overlapping stuff. Um, so this phenomenon happens again and again. Um, sometimes it emphasizes the, the saint, as it does in the Golden Legend. But we see within um, the, uh, the the era in the late 1700s, early 1800s, the phenomena of the, the blue libraries, the Bibliothèque du. And um, these are cheaply mass-produced uh, compendia of just esoteric household whatevers. And this will be, you know, here's a bit on palmistry. Here's a bit on astrology. Here is how to do a chart. Here is how to div do divine using. Here's cartomancy. Here's a bit of bibliomancy. Here is a little demon. Here is a spell on a love spell or something to cure warts, whatever it is. And um, uh, so what's actually within the covers doesn't really matter. But what this, what's significant is on the outside of the covers um, in this period is St. Cyprian. Mm. So the actual contents of the various numerous books of St. Cyprian or books attributed to St. Cyprian are effectively irrelevant um, and, and interchangeable, which is to say they have their own validity, but they're not pertinent to, to why we're talking about St. Cyprian. St. Cyprian is on the cover. And this says here is a Catholic saint that allows this uh, this uh, authority, much as we see within, say, the uh, Lesser Key of Solomon, or Key of Solomon, all the Solomonic grimoire texts. Okay, Solomon, he was king, he's a very wise guy. We, were, we think of him as, as wisdom personified. Um, and, you know, once upon a time before we had this uh, institution of Christian sacrament, you know, God only had these prophets and miracle workers, and Solomon was clearly um, the smartest, and therefore this was his own book, and you could access that. So it, it conveyed this authority and authenticity by invoking the name of Solomon. We see this also with the Cyprianic texts, and so, so Cyprian simply trotted out to go and say, yeah, you're good. Read whatever, <laughs> whatever's in here. <laughs> um, so there are a few things about the contents of uh, the, the grab bags that are that are consistent. Certainly, when you have you know, different uh, different traditions, you know, the Spanish tradition, the Portuguese tradition, you even have the Icelandic tradition, which has absolutely nothing to do with anything except for the name uh, Cyprian. Um, but you have these kind of uh, treasure, the, the the trove of St. Cyprian, and again, they're just kind of pop a culture grab bags of whatever, notes of somebody else's notes, family traditions. Um, but the interesting thread within those is that they're speaking to a lot of authentic 
folk traditions that are surviving um, uh, oral histories and oral uh, practices that speak to African diaspora religions, um, uh, rural um, Mediterranean religious traditions or folkloric traditions that some of which serve no other purpose except for entertainment. Um, and some of them are just fun, but we've been doing this for a very long time and they become encoded and they become important because they connect people to their past. And um, as they, through different periods of history, become kind of taboo or become marginalized, that actually just energizes them. It just pressurizes those particular practices by banning them or even looking askance at them. It makes them a little more appealing, feel like you're getting away with something. And there is definitely that kind of that uh, little whisper of brimstone that, that is um, repulsive to most, but appealing to enough weirdos that it keeps going. So uh, that that era, I think, is, is particularly interesting. Uh, can, can we call that the Streisand effect of occulture? It absolutely is. This, yes, this, the no. Don't look over. What is it with you kids in the forbidden closet of mystery? Um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it definitely does make it make it more appealing. Um, but when you have again um, uh, marginalized communities, so we're talking about uh, uh, poor people who or enslaved people who are uh, keeping their traditions. Alive. These are family traditions or tribal traditions or clan traditions. And particularly when they are displaced, when they start popping up in the Caribbean, they start popping up in Brazil um, and other, other colonial spaces. Um, we start to see these the, the variety um, of these Cyprianic texts that don't seem to have much in common, except that here is now this intermediary we can still keep, you know, grandma's old spells. Uh, grandma's got, got a love spell. We can keep grandma's love spell, if I a piece of string and a puppet or whatever it is, but we've got this authorization because there's a saint on the cover and the, the result is that he is overcoming evil and uh, it legitimizes your pursuit and your interest. So he becomes kind of um, a protective shrink wrap around whatever it is that you want to preserve. So it doesn't really matter what what's ever, what is, what's in that envelope, right? It doesn't matter what's in what's in that container. What matters is there's now this kind of her, literally hermetically sealed um, uh, enclosure that Saint Cyprian is, you know. So it creates this this sphere around it that protects it and preserves it and allows it to survive up to the present day. Um, and um, there are, uh, and we, talk, we can do a whole thing on, uh, which is definitely above my pay grade. And I would suggest you get a real scholar um, instead of just, just a bladder, uninterested bladder mouth. But um, talking about the preservation of uh, African diaspora religions within enslaved communities, and um, uh, but but uh, Cyprian used was very useful in preserving those traditions, and um, there's a parallel in practical work for people that are doing modern or you know, modern like post 1800 uh, magic that relates. Um, uh, or equates quite similarly to say the the demonic pact with with Skirlin, the idea of having an inter a, a magical intermediary, mm -hmm. so that if you're looking at um, uh, some of the grimoires, Skirlin is a character who sort of the first demon you invoke, invoke, he becomes your demon lawyer when people are entering demonic pacts. He's the first pact that you you uh, are or bonded to in his work. And then he facilitates introductions. He's kind of your fixer, um, your, uh, he represents you, he you know, he talks you up to, a, to his demon pals, and then they come and, uh, and then you can sort out your own relationships with them. Um, so we see with the Cyprianic texts, him playing a very similar role. 
he has command over these demons because they're all afraid of him. Um, and some of these demons are obviously vilified pagan deities. Uh, and But we know that St. Cyprian was an initiate of the cultists of each individual pagan deity. So he's on good terms with these guys. Um, and But of course, they'll all um, defer to him because he was a saint. So he'll also protect you. So it gives you this kind of um, uh, safety rope um, around your magical practice because you've got this guy that's on your side, this lawyer, either in the form of Demon, Demon Skirlin or in St. Cyprian himself. Um, Cyprian seems to be everywhere in the, the esoteric world right now, so it's kind of a two-part question. Uh, why is he so popular with occultists of all sorts of different traditions? And should only Christians be working with St. Cyprian? Well, he's right behind you. Uh, in terms of where, of where he is, he's literally in frame. I can see him standing right there. So, you know, if this were a horror movie, it's like, he's right behind me, isn't he? Like, yes, he is. Um, and I, I think that uh, he's still doing what he, uh, that, that the phenomenon of, of Cyprian simply continues to serve the role it always has as a, as a, as a bridge between um, uh, those who find uh, alchemical or esoteric meaning further in, deeper, or occult, hidden, not obvious, not superficial, meaning within sacramental practice. So people who are um, uh, attending Eucharist or engaged in the sacrament of confession, um, so people who are, are finding uh, connection and power through that, but are looking at what's under the hood in terms of the ingredients within those particular uh, sacraments and how they're offered. And uh, there's a lot going on. And the idea of the veneration of saints connects you to other people that have explored these, these, these avenues. There is a sense of community, even if that community um, uh, is, is, is separated by centuries. So you're still you're still part of something. You're 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 pulling on this line of, of inquiry, um, and you know. So for moderns, it's it's the same thing. It legitimizes this this practice, uh, and it does give this sense of um, uh, authorization or authentication into uh, into this inquiry. And because you know, for those who are coming from a, a a, a conventionally Christian milieu, as they get further into this stuff, it's kind of nice to have a saint on your side. For those coming outside of the Christian uh, framing, that are, that are approaching the sacraments from outside of, of a Christian context and may not have been raised that way, and maybe you've, you've grown up either, um, or at least you've spent your adult life in occultism, esotericism, other other forms of, of you know, the, 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 the weirdos, right? So yes. us. Yeah. So um, all you know, Gnosticism, you know, Hermeticism, you know, anything, they, all the isms that you know, all the weirdos. Um, that uh, finding someone, finding this character in this narrative that says, "No, I get it. I get that you had to wander around the entire Mediterranean, and you had to go to the, you know, you weren't trying to be a collector. You were trying to figure out what was going on." And sure, you got initiated to that history school, and yes, you've got that hat, and yes, you've got that password, and you spent some time in, in Order X, or you were really into this particular um, uh, uh, pantheon or approach. Um, and yet here I am. Like, I get it. I, I, I understand that you had to go to a journey to get to this destination that is popping the hood on uh, sacramental epistemology. Um, it's nice. It, he's there because he's nice. And, you know, let's, um, let's establish, you know, one thing right off, um, which is, is of paramount importance. The, the veneration of saints is necromancy. Okay. 
the veneration of saints is necromancy. <laughs> We're always talking about necromancy. So here is Saint Cyprian, the patron saint of, of necromancers. He is the uh, the guy with the keys um, to unlock the knowledge of those who have, have died, the, the knowledge of our ancestors, um, the the all the questions that we have asked ourselves to arrive at this particular space. Um, he's the you know he, he's the, the the guy who is kind of the, the handle on the hammer in this regard so i think that that works because so many of us have got here through these very secure districts um and saint cyprian understands and uh and represents those roots so when i say that you know that the veneration of saints is necromancy we go kind of go back to that argument about goatea um, as a gateway to the to the underworld and we're dealing with the underworld and it's it's interesting you know I, I said before kind of flippantly that it doesn't really matter what's between the covers and obviously it does matter what, what's, what's between the covers uh, but um we see a number of spells that are um you know that are, that are quite consistent uh, and they seem they seem kind of odd um because you know one of them is only with with buried treasure how much buried treasure can there be to find yeah. Um, how common is it? Certainly, at different points, you know, the collapse, you know, the Roman Empire, they're in retreat, they're hiding, you know, the the payroll for this legion as they get out, they're going to come back, and then they they forget where they buried it, or they all got got wiped out. And centuries later, somebody finds a, a a box of Roman coins. That's a thing that actually happened, and happened enough that people wanted it to happen to them. Um, it was sort of the lottery win of the time, but um, uh, the it relates, I think, very closely to invisibility spells, because invisibility is always right behind the buried treasure spells. Again, a pretty weird one. Why, you know, you want to be invisible? There's a, there's a you know, always uh, these myriad steps, um, but you get to be invisible. Um, and what I think is really going on here, uh, and other far better qualified people than I have, have proposed this. Um, you, we see this in, in Jake Stratton Kent's work, we see this in Peterson's work, um, is that uh, these are allegories or at least allusions to um, working with the underworld. So um, that buried treasure, this is about going into the earth to find the wisdom of the earth, uh, the wisdom of the underworld. So um, that's the, the buried treasure. It could be spending time with a with a loved one who has departed. That can be your buried treasure. Uh, in the invisibility is getting through the guards. There's always a, a series of of guards. These are are demons, those are like manies or or um, uh, inherent the, the the genus loci of a particular portal in the underworld or at at a, at a grave site. There's always some kind of spirit that says whoa. Living people over here, dead people over here, those are the rules. You have to get past that guy somehow. Um, and so the invisibility spell is really not about you personally making your body invisible so that, I don't know, that you can can go and see where your business rival hides their, their fortune or whatever it is, um, uh, or, you know, rob a bank. It's, um, it's really talking about um, a spiritual transformation so that you are emboldened to get past these gatekeepers to get into the underworld to access all of the knowledge and and that's really what what necromancy is and so there's saint cyprian with the keys um and he's the intercessor on your behalf on uh, this entire corpus of magic that is about necromancy and dealing with the underworld exactly um why do you think we've seen such a, an explosion in popularity uh, uh, with him lately? Why why has he resurged? Uh, or um, I, I I guess the better way to phrase it, sorry, is that you, you talk about the Saint Cyprian as as a phenomenon, right? As uh, as this event. So why why is the Saint Cyprian phenomenon uh, back in this position of space time? I think that um, certainly with the explosion of the internet and access to information. It is, um, and for those of us who uh, began these these lines of inquiry pre-web, um, and there, there's a, 
an absurd number of us. Um, and, you know, it is the, definitely the white guys in glasses crowd. I will absolutely cop to that. That's, that's um, both, re, both definitely true and definitely a limitation um, yes. of perspective. But we still, we, you know, we started this um, asking these questions in, um, in local libraries, then in university libraries, and in uh, pre-web news groups. And where your access was was extraordinarily limited, and so um, different organizations um, and and orders kind of held the 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 keys or uh, book uh, recommendations, and so um, and a lot of this was done on either very poor scholarship or on really skeletal scholarship. In other words, we didn't have a lot of stuff in translation. We didn't have a lot of source material. In the cases where we did have source material, um, it was misinterpreted and then, you know, you end up kind of having like the, the Marian Zimmer Bradley effect and we have the Murrayite folk witchcraft hypothesis. So you had to kind of hop around a lot to get a complete picture. Nobody had, you know, the whole, the whole, the whole pizza, or right? you always had to kind of go over here for a slice and then over here for slicing. And um, it was was very difficult. So uh, there are a lot of people who, who have settled as, um, as, as I have in my own, I haven't really talked about my own journey here, but you know, I did that thing that so many of us have done, um, not in the interest of wanting a, wanting a hat collection, but rather in um, trying to get a, uh, a comprehensive view of something that that we were individually experiencing, and uh, and that was hard, that was really hard to do. Um, but the internet now has made the um, uh, just the sheer volume of information so interesting that you can do a deep dive into a particular tradition, um, and then you know change channels and and you know move a few hundred years and a few thousand kilometers in another direction, and uh, you know and a year later know more uh, on that particular subject than uh, someone who is writing uh, who from a lifetime of scholarship, even just half a century ago. You can learn more in a year on on YouTube selectively um, and and JSTOR than you could with a PhD in 1960, um, and that's that's just what we have. So when we're looking at um, uh, at older scholarship, you know, what we can can be up to speed and surpass that um with a year of diligent research and so you can kind of hop around the mediterranean as in cyprian has done so he becomes this this kind of mascot um he's very relatable this legend is very relatable to our own individual journeys that we can do now uh, and many of us have done and um uh, and arriving at um at some variation of um that commonality where we have this intercessor. We're still we're talking about necromancy. We're talking about magic, um, and it means a very different thing when you're 40 than it does when you're 18. Um, you know, it, it it visually makes for a much better T-shirt when you're 18, but when you when you're um, uh, when you're 40, 50 years old, and you've been doing this for a couple of decades, um, you know, I, necromancy is um, is really about human connection and it's done in this very quiet and respectful and dignified way um, much like the traditional veneration of saints um, and the uh, so so Cyprian is the patron saint of necromancers represents and embodies this journey that many of us have taken there's now sufficient numbers of us now that we can aggregate and uh, uh, ask questions of one another support one another um, challenge one another as new uh, material comes to light as it's constantly doing as new material comes to translation um, as more critical analysis uh, is being done and um, we can benefit um, through the uh, extraordinary efforts of some really extraordinary people in the field. Yeah. 
Well, unfortunately, we're starting to get to the end of the episode, though. I have more questions, and I know we could we could go long, we could go forever. Uh, but, um, so I guess uh, the, a question to sort of wrap up with is, you, people are listening to the show, uh, they're really loving what you're, what you're saying. They, they, they've got the Cyprian fever. They want to uh, okay. uh, work with St. Cyprian now themselves. What's, um, what's like the first step? Also, uh, they are selectively using YouTube. I appreciate your usage of the word selectively there. <laughs> yes, selectively yes, is selectively, so, yeah. so critical. Yeah, so very, critical. very important. And yeah. and for all our, all the friends and fans watching this right now, uh, when you're doing further research on YouTube on the topic, and particularly on Gnosticism, please be selective. <laughs> selectively, yes, very, very good. Um, honestly, right now, hang on. I gotta be out of frame. Start here. <laughs> um, this is uh, uh, Jake Stratton Kent's uh, beautiful two volume edition um, of the Testament of St. Cyprian the Mage. And the uh, analysis here is, uh, is extraordinary. Uh, and uh, the material itself I, I find fascinating. Um, uh, there are. Um, there are, are constantly new editions. I, Hadian's just doing an, another, uh, could be either a reprint or a new edition. I think there's some, uh, there, there's an update um, to their uh, Cyprianic tome. Um, the uh, Safirino from, I can't remember the name of the press, blanking, unfortunately, sorry. Um, so there are some wonderful new translations that are out there and that are available. Um, I strongly recommend starting with uh, with Jake Stratton Kent's work and, uh, uh, and and pulling on the threads from there. Okay, very awesome. That's a well, scarlet imprint, and they do make a very affordable paperback. Perfect. Okay, amazing. Well, before you go, uh, do you have any plugs? You mentioned uh, there's the victoria.uonite.org. People can find you there online. Extremely yeah, cool. We're here. Um, obviously, during uh, during COVID, um, we're are we aren't uh, doing any gatherings. We're not even uh, at the moment doing anything outside because of current uh, restrictions, and we're just respecting that and uh, keeping everybody healthy and safe so that we can gather uh, intact and hail and hearty uh, when all of this is over. Of course. And before we depart, I have a quick club, uh, a quick. Uh, plug, which is uh, mylandmeditation.substack.com. Uh, I do teaching of uh, secular open meditation, uh, mindfulness. So it's not particularly religious or spiritual or Gnostic. But of course, if you are a spiritual, religious or Gnostic person, uh, it is uh, my belief and the belief of many others that meditation uh, will be a great help on your path. Uh, so it's 11 a.m. every Sunday morning. It's free. It's about an hour sish. We have a break in the middle. There's a few different techniques in a mix of silence and guidance. You can come a couple minutes early if you need instruction. Uh, that said, I still give instruction uh, uh, right at 11 as well. And it's a good crowd of people who, who come out. So feel free to join us any Sunday morning. Okay, well, it's, it's been awesome. Uh, again, once a year, it's so great to see you again. So uh, we'll have to have you back on the show uh, quicker than, I don't know, probably the last hour, probably five years ago. So... <laughs> Well, thanks so much for having me, and uh, if you do, and keep doing it. Yeah, we will do. Okay, have an awesome uh, whatever time it is where you are. Have an awesome. <laughs> okay, have an awesome. Thank you. Have a great incarnation. <laughs> <laughs>